You're listening to mymedicalpodcasts.co.uk. We provide easy access to the growing online world of continuing medical education and produce our own consultant-reviewed MRCP-level podcasts. mymedicalpodcasts.co.uk. Learn on the move. A grade of encephalopathy can be judged by the admitting physician, and if you refer to the hand adjun podcast, one can see that there are four grades of encephalopathy, ranging from rousable and coherent to comatose. It is, of course, reasonably subjective how this is measured, but some effort should be made at judging this. One should exclude Wernicke's encephalopathy caused by vitamin B deficiency, and if encephalopathy is present, one should take a careful drug history to make sure that no sedating drugs have been prescribed. If the encephalopathy persists or is worrying in nature, a computed tomograph of the head should be requested to exclude a subdural or intracerebral bleed. Again, this is more common in those ingesting alcohol, probably due to a number of factors, perhaps relating to the increased risk of coagulopathy, the increased risk of falls, and the relative cerebral atrophy one sees in those who have been drinking heavily over much time. The mainstay of treatment of encephalopathy is lactulose at 20 to 30 millilitres three times a day. This should be given via an NG tube if the patient is deeply encephalopathic. The cause of encephalopathy is thought to be due to the lack of breakdown of bacterial toxins created in the gut by a malfunctioning liver. It is therefore extremely important to keep the gut cleared out. However, lactulose probably has an additive effect in this in that those patients who are clearing their gut regularly may still develop encephalopathy, which lactulose seems to prevent. If this does not work and the patient is still constipated, then a phosphate enema should be prescribed daily until bowel motion is produced. Previously, encephalopathy was treated with protein restriction or neomycin. Recent trials have shown no evidence in favour of these, so indeed a high nutritious diet is required for those with encephalopathy or cirrhosis and no form of antibiotics is thought to be necessary. The development of ascites in cirrhosis is dependent upon three factors hypoalbuminemia, portal hypertension and hyperaldosteronism. In those who develop hyperaldosteronism there is lack of perfusion of the kidneys causing an increased renin release which makes the patient hyperaldosteronemic which is the reason that they are given spironolactone to act as an anti-aldosterone mechanism. If ascites is present, clinically or on ultrasound, then a diagnostic tap should be performed. This can be done in the right or left iliac fossa, but careful palpation must occur to avoid hitting an enlarged liver or enlarged spleen. The acute accumulation of ascites should warrant an urgent ultrasound and dopplers of the hepatic and portal veins. Hepatic vein thrombosis, or Bud Chiari, and portal vein thrombosis may be important in the etiology of ascites and need to be excluded early. The patient should be salt and fluid restricted, and spironolactone at increasing doses from 50 mg should be prescribed as tolerated. One can check the effect of spironolactone by measuring the urinary electrolytes, and a sodium level greater than the potassium level is required to ensure adequate aldosterone suppression. If the ascites is rapidly accumulating and becomes resistant to high-dose diuretics, then abdominal paracentesis can be performed. This should be done in a sterile environment, and for every few litres of ascites taken off, intravenous albumin should be replaced. The theory behind this is that it reduces the risk of hepatorenal syndrome, and also reduces the risk of large fluid shifts in someone with a low serum albumin. If paracentesis is unsuccessful and the fluid reaccumulates quickly, then transjungular intrahepatic portosystemic shunting can occur. This creates a portosystemic gradient and lowers the portal pressures, reducing the accumulation of ascites. However, encephalopathy is a contraindication to this, as one becomes profoundly encephalopathic if you've been encephalopathic before, after shunting. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is an important diagnosis to exclude with someone with ascites. 25% of patients with recurrent ascites will have developed this condition either clinically or subclinically after only one year of ascites presence. It is often culture negative but the major organism causing the disease is E. coli. 
As it is culture negative, the diagnosis is based upon a high white cell count within the acidic fluid, and this is defined as greater than 250 white cells per mil as a diagnostic criteria. If this is present, then a third generation cephalosporin should be used as treatment. Another severe complication of cirrhotic liver disease and decompensation is hepatorenal syndrome, although it is often misdiagnosed. Many conditions, such as sepsis, dehydration, bleeding, may cause renal failure in the acidic or cirrhotic patient. However, this does not mean they have developed hepatorenal syndrome. It is based on a number of major and minor criteria, and these can be seen in the podcast handout. The major criteria include advanced hepatic failure with portal hypertension. So the patient usually has to have an element of ascites, splenomegaly or evidence of portal hypertension. The creatine clearance should be less than 40 mL per minute or the creatinine greater than 150. One should exclude shock, infection or drug causes of renal failure and the protein level in the urine should be less than 500 mg per deciliter with no obstruction evident on ultrasound scans. Minor criteria include a low urinary volume, low urinary sodium, a high urinary osmolality, a low urinary red blood cell count, and a serum sodium of less than 130. If hepatorenal syndrome is confirmed, the patient should ideally be managed on an intensive care environment. Dialysis may be used as a holding measure, but will not reverse the condition, as the deficiency lies mainly with the liver. So the only true treatment is that of a hepatic transplant. Vasopressin analogues such as terlipressin at 2 mg four times a day can also be used as a holding measure to decrease portal pressures and reduce the risk of advancing hepatorenal syndrome. If a cirrhotic patient has decompensations, then they may be considered for a hepatic transplant. The current guidance for this is that the patient should have been abstinent from alcohol for six months or more and they should not have any severe extrahepatic complications of alcohol, such as cardiomyopathy or cerebral dysfunction. The patient must be carefully chosen, as the recidivism rates, i.e. those going back to alcohol, can be as high as 20%. Therefore, it is important to take into account whether one knows the patient will remain abstinent after the transplant. So in conclusion, the rate of alcoholic liver disease is increasing. This is probably mirrored by the fact that drinking is increasing in both adolescents and young women. Not all that drink heavily develop cirrhosis, and it is probably multifactorial as to the risk factors of those that do. In those that have developed cirrhosis, there is a high mortality rate. This is much higher if the patient continues to drink, but is relatively high even in abstinence. Decompensation should be approached in a stepwise manner, Each factor of decompensation, whether it be jaundice, encephalopathy, ascites or variceal bleeding, should be dealt with independently and any precipitating factor should be assiduously excluded. This in particular relates to infection, particularly spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which should be treated early in the course of the disease. Hepatic transplant may be the last resort, but depends on many factors as to whether the patient is suitable. You're listening to mymedicalpodcasts.co.uk. We provide easy access to the growing online world of continuing medical education and produce our own consultant-reviewed MRCP-level podcasts. mymedicalpodcasts.co.uk. Learn on the move.